Thanks for joining us with episode 143 of the Clive Barker podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker. Today's episode focuses on Clive Barker's A to Z of horror, uh, this time letters P, Q, and R. So follow the, li- follow the link in the show notes uh, if you want to watch the TV show, uh, read the three short chapters in your book if you have it, and join us in the discussion on the comments if you like. Uh, all this plus a Kickstarter update, uh, Duels of Blood final round is here, and you're not going to believe who the final matchup is. And of course, Clive Barker News. And, of course, this episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination Shop is dedicated to to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes and on the main website at clivebarkercast.com. That will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints, which are very cool. They're they're kind of Clive Barker like, you know, um, Abrat style. Uh, to get one of his prints or art books and help out with this wonderful program. Any friend of Clive Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank him for his support. Okay. Thanks for joining us. This is episode 143 of the Clive Barker podcast, A to Z and the Duels of Blood. Uh, so this hello. time, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say hello. I'm Joe and, and of course, Ryan. Hey. Yeah, this time we're going to be talking about um, letters P, Q, and R in, mm-hmm. in the uh, the A through Z of horror. So the, those letters are both on the TV show and in the book. Yes, so it's P for pain, Q for quiet men, and R, um, I'm sorry, and um, R, for, R rictus. for rictus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's cool. So, but before we get there, we'll we'll start with the Clive Barker news. Um, Clive Barker's next testament, the novel, not the comic book, is here. Uh, mine actually arrived in the mail last week. And, oh, great. Uh, yeah. It's it's actually way bigger than I would have thought. So I haven't read it yet, but it's 332 pages. Okay, for those of you who who haven't heard of Next Testament, it was a comic book that was put out by Boom Studios, uh, and the main character is this um, uh, Wick, the master of colors, right? Yeah, yeah. The, and there's a, in this in this novelization, there's a, a a gorgeous color painting on the on the cover page. Or the signature page, I guess it is. Yeah, Clive Barker painting. Yes, yeah. that's pretty beautiful. I actually got copy number nine out of three fifty. So I was surprised because I didn't order it, you know, first thing when the when the pre order was announced. I had waited a couple of days. Mm-hmm. But, so this is released by Earthling Publications, right? Yeah, yeah, and and surprisingly, there's only three hundred and fifty gift copies, which are the the, the cheaper ones. Mm-hmm. 100 deluxe copies and only 15 lettered copies. So I don't know what letter of the alphabet that is, but they just, they don't make it through all the letters. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, there's uh, some signatures on those limited copies. Mark Allen Miller, Clive Barker, and F. Paul Wilson, yeah. who I think does some sort of uh, uh, introduction to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. And there's an acknowledgment at the beginning. And I'm going to say the synopsis. By Clive Barker and an introduction by F. Paul Wilson. Yeah. There we go. And I'm going to give a quick, quick synopsis. Next Testament tells the story of Julian Desmond, who unearths a figure unlike any other, who calls himself Wick, and who claims to be the god of the Old Testament. Julian takes Wick to the modern world, where Wick can operate behind the curtain with the movers and shakers of the world. But when Wick is exposed to the world's most modern conveniences, he is disgusted and begins the process of bringing back the old ways. Wick and Julian's journey will span the globe as neither merely wants to make a mark on the world, but a scar. It's up to Julian's son, Tristan, and Tristan's fiancée, Elspeth, to solve the puzzle of Wick's existence and keep the world from entering a new dark age. First there was the Old Testament, then there was the New Testament. Now we embark upon the newest chapter in our collective history, the Next Testament. God has returned. God help us all. That's the tagline. Yeah. 
Well, and with this being over 300 pages, I'm guessing it's going to be more fleshed out and quite a bit different from the comics. Yeah, because they say they go uh, all across the globe. And in the comic book, they just really stayed in America for most of the yeah. miniseries. Yeah, I think they had like they'd have like maybe one page saying like this is what happened in France. Oh yeah, right. And yeah. it starts in Egypt, I think, in the middle of the desert. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's you know, and, and uh, it's a gorgeous edition. You know, Earthling always does a really good job with these books. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to reading that. I think we'll have an episode with that and the um, the, the Leviathan book. We'll kind of put those together maybe in one episode, and uh, in the in the near future. That sounds very interesting. And uh, Mark Miller's quote on this, uh, he said that Next Testament is a project that is deeply personal to me. I want to thank Clive for allowing me to collaborate with him from the beginning of the project and for writing a foreword that moved me to tears. I also want to thank Boom Studios for giving the story a home in its original comic form where it can live on in perpetuity and find new and exciting incarnations. And finally, I want to thank Paul Miller and Earthling Publications for publishing my first novel, their guidance from editing to printing has been a thrill. I hope those who pick up the book are as changed by reading its words as I was writing them. So that was in September of last year. And now this is super limited, but I hope that uh, I hope that it's successful and that they're able to put it out, you know, to some kind of mass market form, paperback or ebook or something. Sure, yeah, that would be great. Um, so next, this is uh, if you're Swedish, this is you know, uh, this is news there's a swedish edition of hellbound heart that came out on may 31st yes and um it's it's uh okay i'm gonna try to say the the title of this um <laughs> I, I, i'm not even gonna i wouldn't even give it a shot uh it, it's called the hellbound heart so it's et hjarta at elvetet so that's what it means the hellbound heart i'm guess hjarta means heart yeah. so uh it costs 190 swedish kroner and uh, I can't read anything else on the website. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it has a great looking cover. Uh, uh, there's a big, kind of a big square jawed pinhead yeah. covered in pins, and uh, his face is, is 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 put in front of a background that's like the box panel, uh, the, the Hellraiser box. So it, it looks pretty pretty nice. Um, how much is 190 kroner in dollar? Let me look that up. Yeah. Well, I think it might be very expensive. And and kudos to Phil and Sarah for you know finding this story and then translating it enough to figure out the release date and everything. Oh, I see. the The cost of it is about twenty eight point eight U S dollars. That so that's not too like expensive. Probably a hardcover then. Yeah, that's just probably what it is. Um, well, you know, thanks to the magic of Google, I can actually translate their page uh, of Vertigo Furlog to uh, English. Oh. It says here, greed and love of love and despair, desire and death, life imprisonment, hooks, chains, and the blood. Clive Barker's chilling masterpieces of forbidden desire and terrible resurrection as are the basis for the movie Hellraiser. This is automatic translation, so uh, yeah. I'm just going by it. It, it doesn't Since, sound too bad, though. Yeah. Frank Otten's insatiable appetite for pain and dark pleasures led him to the mystery of the Le Marchand's Cube, and from there to a death that only a disturbed mind could conceive. But his brother's lovelorn wife, Julia, has discovered a way to resurrect Frank, but the price will be bloody and terrible, and it will definitely cost hell. Or I think this might be cost hell to pay or something, yeah. Mm. Um, so it's uh, translated by Carolyn Grimwalkers. That's a, that's a cool name. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's uh, published by Vertigo in Sweden. So if you're Swedish, you know, pick it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's so always Philip fun to read. You, you have to buy this now because you're, right. you're the Swedish person that we know. Yes, you're the <laughs> Swedish person we know. So. That's a Clive Barker fan. There's also a new heavy metal magazine issue that features Clive Barker. Um, I think it will be number 286. And uh, it has, like, a, an epic article by Grant Morrison on Chaos Magic inside. Uh, it's going to be a magic special. It's, yeah. it's about magic. So, so mm. there's a Clive Barker interview and some Clive Barker artwork. And then um, and then uh, Mark Miller and Ben Mears and Christian Francis all adapted one of Clive's paintings and made a comic book of it. And that's in – or a comic story of it, and that's in there as well. Yeah, it's a comic adaptation of Clive's painting, Lighting the Way. Um, 
And um, yes, you can find a 14-page preview uh, in, in a, a post that you did recently on June 2nd. So you could go on our blog, find the, 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 the post that talks about the new heavy metal magazine, and there's a link in there for a 14-page preview so you can get a teaser of the comic adaptation. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm probably going to get a copy at Barnes & Noble. Yeah. Um, I, the one thing I didn't quite get is if it's out already or not. As we're recording this, today is the 3rd of June. So I'm not, it's probably a June issue. I would imagine it's probably there. I'm going to head over to Barnes & Noble at some point and see if it's there and get it. Right. It's eight dollars and ninety five cents for the magazine. Yeah. So the last thing, this isn't really news, but um if there's anybody out there that's interested in writing for us, we don't pay money, but sometimes we get some perks, you know, in the form of collectible previews. Yeah, collectible yeah. stuff, uh, you know, pre pre uh pre preview copies of books and things like that you know it, it's kind of nice it's that's been pretty neat for for us yeah um, absolutely yeah um whatever little money we have at the end of a fundraiser we split up but um usually goes for equipment or uh ordering a book that's coming out or something like that yeah but what, what we we could use some help with writing the news stories i mean i i had I, I was looking at, at our website, and, and uh, the, we had two posts in a row from Rob, who's doing one post a week of the scene of a week, and there were two of those in a row. And I'm like, oh, my God, we let a whole week go by without anything. you know. And, and it's been a slow news week, that's true, but still I think we could use a little bit of help. Um, you know, we got stuff going on with us that makes it a little hard sometimes to. Yeah, sometimes uh, we have to go through a few, like, uh personal problems that we have to overcome but um yes uh if you like writing for a blog if you're willing to be paid occasionally in swag and and preview copies <laughs> yeah. um and you you're a Clyde Barker fan and you know are familiar with the uh, wordpress uh, platform please uh send us write to us and send us like a news story that our example that we can look at and see if yeah. you're uh, if you, you could contribute to our blog so that'd be great and news stories don't have to be huge i mean usually the ones i do will be like two paragraphs um, sure yeah but uh yeah just you know just show us that you can that you're kind of keeping an eye on clive barker news and that you know you found something interesting and and uh send it to us and and you know we'll see that's right so hope hope to get some submissions thank you for your attention yeah and a uh, Kickstarter update. So we did skip a week this time around just because we had some stuff going on with us and I didn't quite uh, finish reading the body book yet. So uh, we we took a week off from the podcast. Um, and in that time, there's actually been no updates for from uh, the app development side. I mean, we have our iPhone app done and we got one mm -hmm. review that was really nice on the iPhone app. But um, we haven't heard anything about the uh, Android version. You know, I, I would think that that would be, you know, they, they would have most of it, you know, ready to go, that it's going to be pretty similar to the iPhone one. But I don't know. I'm, I, you know, I'm maybe we'll have to send them an email and, and find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. We'll check in on it because I, I, I've been um, thinking about updating our, our outro, you know, that's then to talk about the apps and stuff. And there's also something on there that bugs me every time I hear it. You know, I say. You can find the show notes for this page, and it's like this isn't a page; it's a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. So, but I I, I want to be able to when I put the iPhone app on the website, I want you know a link to it. I want to be able to put the Android one there too, next to it, instead of just like a question mark or coming soon or whatever. So hopefully that we'll hear from we'll hear back about that soon. And you know, other than that, we've been uh, we've been you know going down through our list of, of episodes that, that uh, we promised through our Kickstarter. Um, I've, I've been uh, slowly working on getting more into YouTube. Yeah. And at some point we'll get back into, uh, get back into the transcribing episodes for the book again. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's true. Uh, we have to get back on that and, uh, and uh, then we'll begin the selection process. But that book is coming this year, so yeah. you know, stay tuned. Um, we're we're just two people having to go through a lot of hours of of recorded stuff, but uh, yeah. um, it's it's going to be worth it in the end. And 
it's going to have an exclusive Clyde Barker cover. So that's that's something to look forward to. Yeah. And that leads us into the duels of blood. So <laughs> final four. Yeah. Did you look at the results of this? I know it, it was weird. It was surprising. It was very surprising. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's this is going to be a quick quick section of the episode, yeah. I guess. But it's like the final four. They were Hapexamendios versus Mendelssohn Shape. Yeah. And Harry Damore versus Mahogany. Yeah. So so imagine what do you think is the outcome going to be? And it was the opposite. Absolutely. I was like, <laughs> what? And, not so, even, and that wasn't even close. It doesn't. I was like, where, I know. Am I am I that far removed from the rest of the Clive Barker fandom that I don't? <laughs> I, don't I guess know. someone really liked Mendelssohn Shape because <laughs> yeah. in the first match, Apex Mendios versus Mendelssohn Shape, yeah. Mendelssohn Shape won with seventy one percent of the votes. <laughs> Like what? So okay. he goes to the last round. Yeah, Mendelssohn and Shape. He's the one foot killer. Yeah, I mean he's he's sympathetic, I guess. And Hepexamendios is not sympathetic, but he's a I guess little, one he's is a little bit sympathetic. Yeah. He is still an assassin. Yeah, he is more sympathetic than Hepexamendios, for sure. Yeah. But uh, and then in Harry de Moore versus Mahogany, yeah. Mahogany won. Well, and yeah, uh no. <laughs> Again, another unexpected thing. I was like, oh, okay. So Mahogany won with 73% of the votes. Yeah. So I guess people were really like into the, the character that he played and uh, that Vinnie Jones played in the uh, uh, the Midnight Meat Train. Yeah. Um, so so this, we're going to have a crazy final round with Mendelssohn Shape versus Mahogany. And uh, I... I think Mahogany may win. I don't know, but, yeah, it's, but I'm not going to put my hands on fire for it. We're also in opposite worlds. <laughs> so, yes. So Mendelssohn Shape might win. But I was so thinking... all the other all the other cool characters like Gentle, Candy Crackenbush, yeah. Piopa, uh, Swan, uh, Raul, uh, all those other characters they've all fallen by the wayside, and there these are the. More. I was like, I wanted him to. I wanted him to win so bad, but I know. Maybe people were thinking about thing. maybe people were thinking about the Harry the Moore from the Boom Studio comics. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, well you you know I, and I put um, I even made a post. I'm like, hey, Harry the Moore needs your help. He's getting hammered by mahogany, and uh, and he needs um, he, you know help him climb out of the darkness. And and uh, so some people went on there and voted, but geez, there's just a lot of mahogany fans, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and Vinnie Jones because that's the picture that's on uh, on his uh, character. It's yeah. the, the Vinnie Jones picture. So I am surprised, but at the same time, I'm happy that that the result was so unexpected because that makes it interesting. It, yeah. it really makes you see like from all these like 64 characters that we started with. Now we're gonna have the final match down between Mendelssohn Shape and Mahogany. Yeah. So. That is going to be interesting. And if Mahogany wins in the bonus round, we'll have a hammer fight between between Julia and Mahogany. Oh! <laughs> hammer fight! Yeah. Oh, my God. Although Stop! Hammer think, time! Yeah, God. I think Mahogany's hammer is a lot bigger. Uh, that's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's the Duels of Blood, the final four. Um, like like you said, there may be a final round with a hammer fight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we yeah. have to find two pictures of them w uh, holding their hammers yeah. and make a little, like, Mortal Kombat-style thing. <laughs> yeah. Round one, fight. Test, test your might. Yeah. So, um, uh, okay, that's that's Duels of Blood. Very yeah. unexpected. Uh, a lot of underdogs making through all the six rounds. So, uh, yeah, yeah let's, let's see what happens uh, in a couple of weeks. I wanted Harry to win. I wanted him to win too. I voted for him, and I voted for Mendelssohn Shape. Yeah, I did too. That's that's who I voted for. So I guess you know I. But Hepexamendios was way ahead of Mendelssohn Shape in the beginning, and then all of a sudden I look at the end, and it's like he just got creamed. Mm hmm. He did like seventy three percent and seventy one percent. Yeah. The 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 bad guys won by three quarters of a margin there. Oh, yeah. So although Hepexamendios is a bad guy too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, so just poor Harry, surrounded by by evil. He tasted the darkness. <laughs> yeah.
so okay, that's Clive Barker's a um, that's Duels of Blood, yeah. and uh, like you said in the beginning, this week we're talking about the A to Z of horror, P, Q, and R. Yeah. So, did you watch anything in preparation for this, like movies or I something? I did. Yeah. In so in uh, Q for Quiet Men, there was um, there was a the movie The Raven, and I watched that mm-hmm. one. So we'll 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 go back to that when we get there. Okay. Yeah. So in P for Pain, uh, the chapter is pretty much dedicated to uh, the work of Tom Savini. Yeah. The, the special effects artist Tom Savini. And uh, in the book, it goes on for like a few pages. Yeah, all about special effects and and uh, how he was a Vietnam War veteran and and uh, or photographer, right? He was a war photographer, and and uh, yeah. he, in his work in special effects, he tries to capture the realism of what he saw as a war photographer. Right. There was a, a line that he said that I thought was very interesting. Uh, he said that when people die in movies, they usually just close their eyes, close their mouth, and look very peaceful. And it's like in real life when someone dies, especially in a brutal way, that's not what happens at all. You got the slack jaw. You got the open eye. Mm-hmm. You got like the grim face, the, the grimacing face. So he always wanted to introduce that that element of realism into his work. And, uh, yeah, like you said, he was in the Vietnam War, and his job was to be a photographer. So – he would go in and take photos after an attack of, like, equipment and casualties to see what happened with the bombardments and stuff. So yeah. I, that that must have been really, really uh, a terrible job to do. But uh, luckily he was able as an artist to, to turn that thing into a, a, a driving thing for his work, for his special effects work. So that's, that was a good thing. Yeah, I, and I like I like his his approach to special effects. He's kind of like a magician that there's a lot of like misdirection and and uh, you they know. do call him the Wizard of Gore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought about watching like maybe Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead or Night of the Living Dead 1990, but those are movies that I've seen lots and lots of times. So I just I kind of opted for something that I hadn't seen since I was in high school instead. Okay, so so did you watch what? Are you talking about The Raven, or are you yeah. talking about any of these movies? Okay, no, no. I mean, I've I've seen those a lot of times, though. I mean, I, yeah. He he directed Night of the Living Dead, nineteen ninety, but he didn't actually do special effects for it. But the effects on it were really good. He was the creep in Creep Show two, I think. It was Tom oh, Savini, really? and you may have seen him in other movies like uh, uh, From Dawn Till Dusk. He plays this character called Sex Machine. Right. Right. <laughs> that has a gun that comes out of his crotch. <laughs> I, I just remember him from spending hours rubber band fighting him while I was hanging out in the in the Occupy Midian booth at uh, at uh, Monster Mania in New Jersey. That's right. That's right. You keep you keep mentioning that. That must have been funny. Yeah. Uh, so he was raised in uh, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and one of his major uh, one of his major uh, inspirations was the actor Lon Chaney Sr. Because everybody knows that he used to do his own makeup, and he did, you know, awesome makeups like uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame and mm-hmm. and the Phantom of the Opera, where he would really do some weird stuff to his face. I mean, yeah, he did his own makeup on his own face, right? Just to yeah, to try to get himself into character more. Sure. And then, of course, Savini met G- uh, George Romero during his junior year in high school, and that's kind of what what uh, started really his professional career. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and he's he also is a he's also plays one of the bandits in Dawn of the Dead. Do you know the that movie? Um, I think it's Day of the Dead, the one where the zombies all look like they have blue faces. Uh, that's Dawn of the Dead, the one in the Dawn movie. of the Dead, yeah. the one that takes place in the shopping mall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's in that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, isn't there like also a scene uh, in a, the remake of that movie where there's a bunch of bikers that go into the mall and stuff, and they do all sorts of crazy stuff? I'm trying to. I I've, I saw the remake a couple of times, and I think I kind of decided that I didn't like it. Okay, yeah, I, I've seen those, but they were really, really a long time ago. Yeah. But it seems like Tom Savini was always into the whole uh, makeup effect thing because he, at the age of 14, he was already doing his first professional employment as part of a traveling act that performed horror and magic shows in movie theaters. And um, so, yeah, he's he's been a pretty amazing artist throughout all his career. You know, first movie he worked on was... 
I think one of the one of the first movies was like uh, Dead of Night, uh, seventy two, Deranged in seventy four, Martin seventy six, Dawn of the Dead, seventy nine, and then you know all these other movies from Dust Till Dawn, nineteen ninety five, yeah. and uh, The Day of the Dead, nineteen eighty five. Um, very, very cool stuff that he always makes, and uh, he's still he's still going at it. So they they talk about that Joe Pilato scene in Day of the Dead where he he gets ripped in half. Oh and, yeah, yeah, and that and that he had all of these um, guts he, he, and yeah, all these guts, and somebody had forgotten to plug the refrigerator in, so they were all rotten and and uh, smelled horrible. Yeah, I, you could see some behind-the-scenes footage in the TV show episode of A to Z of Horror, oh. where they they shoot the scene, they pull out the legs, and they tear the guy apart, and then they say cut, and the zombies all start like waving their hands in front of like the actor's face, so they could wa- so they could like waft away the smell of the stuff from his face because he was about to barf. So that must that must have been really really bad. So and if you're if you're uh, looking for the TV show, just go to our show, no- show notes and the playlist, and it's in episode five, and it's the second part. So you got D for, for the Devil Rides Out, and then right after is P for Pain. And he also worked on Friday the Thirteenth, um, which I think was one of those movies w- that kind of launched uh, Kevin Bacon's career. Was that like the first movie that he was in? Yeah, he gets the arrow through the neck. Yeah. Right, I think. right, and that was yeah. all like the mother killing all these counselors, right? Yep. And Jason was heart barely really even in it. Yeah, and they talk about Jack Pierce a little bit, the guy who created a lot of makeup monsters for uh, for Universal. Um, and here's one of his philosophies, uh, Tom Savini's quote is, one of my philosophies is to use the real actor as much as possible. It is important for the audience to see the pain and the violence happen to a real person. So if I have to cut a throat instead of taking a fake head and using a real knife, I will take a blade with a groove that looks like it's in the throat when it's on. By using the real actor, you can have the changes in facial expression, the scream, and even blood coming out of the knife. I mean, we've all seen that sort of trick knife, right? That's got like a little circle cut into it. Yeah. And you... Put it, put that part of the circle on top of your arm, and you're like, "Oh no, I cut my arm." Yeah. So yeah, old old timey practical stuff. Of course, nowadays everything is CGI. Yeah, but um, it seems like there's kind of a resurgence in practical effects that people appreciate. You know, partly for nostalgia and partly because you want the actors to actually, you know, feel like they're looking. You know, you to 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 perform in a way where they're looking at the thing that's actually happening. Mm-hmm. Like like he says at the end of this chapter, it's uh, it's more of a challenge today to frighten film audiences, Savini believes. These days, you're not going to frighten audiences with more gore. Before effects became elaborate, a mere skeleton was scary. Effects, guys <laughs> like me, spoiled people. The more we show them, the more they wanted to see. We were in a position of trying to outdo ourselves. In some ways, I became a captive of my own success. And uh, that's that's quite true. Um, yeah. I mean, nowadays there are some more indie movies try to bring back more uh, practical effects again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but generally, everything is CGI now. So green screen CGI. Uh, yeah. And it's it's kind of sad because you don't see that realism in things, right? It's yeah. It's getting yeah. But at the same time, CGI is getting better. So you know, you can do things that. You couldn't do with practical effects, I guess. Right. Yeah. The hard part is is getting the actors to understand what they're looking at. You can you can even bring. I'm sorry about that. You can even bring uh, people like uh, you know like like Peter Cushing back from the dead for like a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Although yeah, whether or not that was extremely successful is kind of debatable, but you know. I I really liked that movie, but I kind of felt like that particular thing with Peter Cushing that they were showing off too much, you know, and it's like they could have just said had him like say a line, but they sure. had, they had like big long dialogues with him and it's like or have more scenes where they just shot him from the back yeah. and they have him be more like a presence but not so much like right on the the center of the scene, you know. Yeah, and it it just felt like okay, you know, you it's distracting because I, you know, they, yes, I think they did a good job, but it's distracting because you're not listening to what he's saying. You're thinking, how are they doing that? I mean, he's this is a dead guy. Yeah, you're looking at the the uncanny valley effect. You're looking at like, oh, his chin moves a little weird, or like, yeah. his, you know, his hair doesn't move when he moves his head, or something like that. Yeah, yeah it's a little yeah. jarring. 
Yeah, yeah. I, mean, Jedi. I think maybe watching it. I've watched it twice now because I bought it when it came out on Blu-ray, and I think it, it it'll get it gets a little easier. But the first time, I was not really listening to him. I was just sort of marveling at the fact that, you know, he's an actor in the movie. He wasn't even like a. It wasn't even really a cameo. Right. Right. I mean, right. He, he's he's a real character. Several scenes. Yeah, there was a guy who did the motion capture and uh, and they did the voice as well with the uh, voice actor and they uh, put everything together. It's pretty interesting. And P- you know, Peter Cushing, he was also one of the quiet men. I mean, he was a, a gentleman. He was a British gentleman who played a horrible, horrible role sometimes in Hammer films. But that leads us into the next letter, which is Q for quiet men. Yeah. Where where they talk a lot about. Um, I think there was one quote from Clive Barker that says something like, let's see what, what that quote was. Um, it was something that he says that sometimes the monsters are played by these really, really uh, gentlemen. And that it's like you can't just – let me see if I can find that quote here. Some of our best friends are monsters. However, it has also been found – that monsters who on the screen are the most hideous of creatures can in reality be among the most pleasant of folk. And this this is very heavy in the uh, TV episode. Uh, they're basically talking to Roger Corman in his house, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, kind of wandering around through his house and ta- talking to him, and he would remember about um, Vincent Price and Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre. Some of the things that he said about uh, these these fine actors was that Vincent Price, of course, he was – he was um, he had a he was always a, a very good actor and he had a, a, a he studied with the, the Royal College Royal Academy of Dramatic Art so as a classical actor so uh, he had the formal movements and techniques to bring to his role then he also met uh, Peter Lorre and he mentioned one time uh, he told him a story like when he was in Germany because he's German, Peter Lorre. Mm-hmm. But when he was in Germany, that he got a call from someone from the Nazi party telling him that Hitler really liked his work in movies and he wanted him to be the spokesman for the new Germany. And Peter Lorre uh, reminisced about this with Roger Corman and told him the next day I was on a boat to the United States, <laughs> yeah. you know, because he didn't want to he didn't yeah. want to be part of it, of course. Um, and and then there was Boris Karloff, who worked in The Raven as well. Yeah. Uh, also a very, very uh, British, posh gentleman. I mean, we talked about Boris Karloff when we were doing the audio commentary for Gods and Monsters. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he was just a he was just a big, you know, very calm, quiet gentleman. Like yeah. to drink his tea and smoke his cigarette, and. Um, I, yeah. I, my my biggest memory of Boris Karloff was the the um, how the Grinch stole Christmas, you know, and oh. Horton hears a who that the animated he did mm-hmm. he did all the narration for that. Oh, I see. I think I remember Boris Karloff. Maybe the first time I saw him, it might have been this. It might have been a Roger Corman movie. It might have been The Terror or mm-hmm. something like that with Jack Nicholson. Right. Um, right. Yeah, which is one of the first movies that Jack Nicholson was in for Roger Corman, I think. I may be wrong. And that movie I watched, The Raven, had Jack Nicholson in it. Yes. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah, he plays like the the guy who's driving the coach and uh, he, he's in love with uh, the, the, the female uh, love interest, right? Yeah, he's the son of, of Peter Lorre's character. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that movie a long time ago, so I, I didn't rewatch it for this oh, one. Okay. I didn't have the time. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was really funny to watch. Um, the fir- the first time I saw it, I was in high school, and I was like, "How could they make a movie out of the of a, out of a poem?" And so I watched it, and I was pretty cynical and like, "This is dumb." But you know, watching it this time, uh, I thought it was great. It was really funny. Um, it is. It just doesn't have anything to do with the story of Edgar Allan Poe at all. You know, no. it's, well, it was written by, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Robert Matheson, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that's it. Richard Matheson. Richard, I'm sorry. Yeah, Richard. Go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the, the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. It's just for the fact that Peter Laurie for some time has turned into a Raven Yeah. and he gets this really funny like suit when he's like mid transformation. Well, and he's mourning his lost Lenore, who turns up to be a turns out to be a character in this, you know, in the movie. And 
She That's true. Yeah. She, they she, adapted she, it. Yeah. She didn't really die. She faked her own death and was like a um hanging around with Boris Karloff, who's the bad guy. Yeah. They were also together in other movies like The Comedy of Terrors, um, along with uh Basil Rathbone. Hmm. Uh they were together there, Peter Lorre, Vincent Price, Boris Karloff and Basil Rathbone. Um so yeah, at some point they they were really, really uh they were doing all these amazing, fun, entertaining movies. Uh, and in The Raven, they say that uh, – in this book, they say that uh, Peter Lorre would, would ad-lib all of his lines and Boris Karloff would be, what do I say? What do I do? <laughs> he, he's not saying the lines that are in the script. I don't know how to respond. Right, because he was kind of like a, a, a method actor. So I guess he was kind of in, he was kind of in, embodying the character and, and responding in a way that the character would respond to the lines. Yeah. But poor Boris Karloff, he memorized the lines. So <laughs> yeah. Roger Corman told him, well, try to, you know, adapt your lines to around what his answers are and try to work with it. And I think that uh, Boris had kind of a, a heck of a time with that. Yeah, they say but Vincent, Vincent Price, Price was, was playful. Good. Yeah, he was yeah. good with it. He would really appreciate the new angles and play along with them. So, yeah, um, the, watch that movie, The Raven. Watch yeah. also The Comedy of Terrors. Those are movies that are very entertaining. And, um, of course, you can never go wrong when you have Vincent Price and Boris Karloff and Peter Lohr. Peter Lohr, uh, first thing I saw with him was a German film called M, um, where he plays this guy – which nowadays you probably would call him like a, a pedophile or something, but he's a guy who goes around and kidnaps little ki kids from uh, playgrounds mm. and and he murders them. And then uh, the situation gets so bad in the city that, that the, the police start cracking down and, 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 and cracking down on all crime in the city because there's so many cops outside trying to catch this killer that the Guild of Thieves in that movie kind of gets together and says, we have to find out who this killer is. So the cops can get off our backs. Yeah. And there's an wow. actual trial. They catch him and then there's a trial. He's being tried by the Guild of Thieves, you know, because like, you know, you're destroying our business. You're you're you know, we have to get rid of you somehow. And I'm not going to spoil any more of the movie, but it's a really good movie. M. Well, that's interesting. Now, now I want to see that. Yeah, it's a very good movie. You have to watch it with uh, subtitles, I guess. Mm. It's from 1931. And it's Italian? No, it's German. Oh, German. Okay. And here's also another movie I saw that I really like. It's called uh, uh, Mad Love, also known as The Hands of Orlac. It's about this scientist, and, you know, he's got mechanic hands, and he's got his face, like, he's got a weird mask, and he's got, like, this cape and hat. And he's it, – it's, it's really amazing. Very striking character. Um, I've seen this movie a long time ago. I think the original version of The Hands of Orlac – had this character who plays um, – what was his name? He was also a German actor. He He's in uh, – let me see. But, yeah, so Vincent Price, of course, I've seen him a lot in the Poe cycle uh, of movies by Roger Corman. Um, yeah. That, that's probably where I saw him first. And also The Last Man on Earth. Right, right, yeah. Uh, my first exposure to Vincent Price was just through the um, music, you know, the – my Michael Jackson thriller, you know, song and, and Alice Cooper's Black Widow. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's probably the first time I've heard his voice was probably the thriller video. And and on the and his appearance on the Muppet Show. Oh yeah, remember that part with the Kermit? Yeah, biting his with neck. Kermit yeah. yeah, Kermit grows fangs and bites him in the neck. Yeah. So the Hands of War like version I was talking about, the original one, uh, that doesn't have uh, Peter Lore. Mm -hmm. is the one that was uh, directed by Robert Vine and stars Conrad Veidt. That's the guy I was thinking about. Ah. So, yeah, it's after losing his hands uh, after losing his hands in an accident, a world-famous pianist receives transplanted hands that once belonged to a murderer, and then that kind of takes over. Whoa. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like um, – it seems like there's been other movies or stories that have that kind of premise where somebody gets a body part transplanted from somebody else and they take on – and that they get sort of possessed. Yeah, like an eye or a pair of eyes or something that belong yeah. to a murderer. And... Or a heart transplant. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's – that's comes back from the idea, I guess, that uh, 
parts of your body after you're dead, if they're transplanted somewhere else, they're still alive. So a part of you is still alive. And I guess if you believe in a soul or anything like that, or like, of course, obviously, hands don't have a brain. They don't have anything that could mm-hmm. keep a consciousness, uh, obviously. I mean, but it's like there's a movie by uh, – there's a movie with Michael Caine where it's – I think it's called The Claw. And it's also about a guy who's a comic book uh, artist, I think. And he loses his hand in an accident, and then he – it's not that he gets a hand transplanted back. It's that the hand that he lost in the accident actually crawls back into his life and kills people. Oh, jeez. Okay. But then that might all be in his head. So it's oh, – yeah. Wow. Michael Caine, I think it's called The Claw. Hmm. And I'm not talking old. about uh, – yeah, let's see if I can find it. Michael Caine filmography, or is it The Hand? Let me see. I know I'm, I'm Googling it up as we're talking, but okay. yes, The Hand, 1981. It's a cartoonist. Michael Caine loses his hand in a car accident, and then it comes back to crawl around and kill people. Uh, 1981, The Hand. Go check uh, it out. It's a good movie. It's got Michael Caine. He's a great actor in it. I think The Claw is that one about the giant vulture, right? Uh, giant vulture? Yeah, yeah, The Giant Claw. That keeps saying that he's big as a battleship. Right, and he, he he eats people and stuff. Yeah, and there's also The Claw with Jim Carrey in uh, Liar Liar. <laughs> you uh, remember that? No, I don't think I saw that movie. It's a it's a joke that Jim Carrey does. He's got a kid, but he's divorced. And, oh, uh, every wait, yes, I do remember that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, look says, out, Uh-oh. here comes The Claw. And then he tickles his son and whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, that, that uh, pretty much covers it for a uh, cue for quiet men. Yeah. And then, and then I think, R yeah, the most R- interesting one. R for Rictus. Now, this was only like two pages in the book, and it was really short also in episode two, uh, mm-hmm. second to last part. Um, I think we mentioned it before when we started, when we started doing this uh, yeah. A to Z discussion. I think I mentioned it. Uh, because it was in one of the TV episodes. Right, right. Yeah, because it was the, the first TV episode we watched was episode two because it has B in it. Right. Yeah. So, but um, Fr- so Franz Xavier Messerschmidt, right? It's um, he was an artist that that was that uh, went through some psychosis and and uh, felt like if he made these if he made these faces, it pinched his face, you know. Um, then uh, then that would sort of keep the demons away or evil spirits. Right. He was a uh, 18th century sculptor. And um, at the age of 35, he started getting some, some mental illness. And that he claimed uh, to one of his friends at one point that he realized that the spirit of proportion envied him for coming so near to perfection in his sculpting work. And so the spirit would cause him physical pain. And to fight this pain... He would um, he would devise a series of, of of pinches and you know hand ex- face expressions, and then he would look at himself in a mirror doing these things, and he would try to make these sculpted heads that would protect him from the influence of these demons. Um, it's hard to say to what extent his mental illness was uh, you know destroying his life. Because he was still an artist. I mean, he still had a yeah. kind of a career, and he still made all these like amazing sculpt, sculpts, uh, busted sculpted heads. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm just being a little ranty because I didn't sleep much last night. But mm. he made a series of 48 busts, and he he gave different words, uh, different names to them, like like uh, feelings and stuff. And he would use those heads as kind of their his little private pantheon that would protect him from this spirit. And the, he mentions one time he um, he decided to fix these grimacing proportions permanently as an army of magical heads to protect me from the spirits. And he said, there is one particular sculpt, though, yeah. that is very strange. It's got this really misproportioned head. The mouth, it, no mouth could do what that mouth is doing. It almost looks like a beak. And he says that, about that head, he says, And the demon pinched me that time. I tell you, it nearly did it for me. Luckily, I let off a sudden hellish fart and disappeared in the midst of a dreadful stench. Or it would surely have been the death of me. Well, he said so, it, it let off a sudden hellish fart. 
Right. It's yeah. not not the artist, the yeah. demon. The demon let off a fart and disappeared. Yeah. So yeah, right. that's his uh, report of how he came up with that particular misshapen head. Kind of like uh, which which demon was that in the last illusion that that deflated and went and flew around the room? Was that the red oh, tree? I the, think so. Right? Was it yeah. the one that sang and had light come out of his body? Yeah, I think it was yeah. the rappery. I think it was that. I think you're so right. I wonder if if Clive Barker, you know, got his inspiration from from uh, from Messerschmitt. Yeah. So um, right. So. Yeah, so but later years of Messer Schmidt was he he was in Vienna and then he moved back to his native village, and uh, and then he moved on to Munich where he was still doing some commissions, and um, he spent the last six years of his life almost in retirement in the outskirts of a city called Pressburg that's now Bratislava, hmm. and he dedicated his himself primarily to the character heads that he created. Uh, there's even a lithograph that depicts his, all the heads together. It's a very oh, fantastic cool. little lithograph. I'm going to add this one to the show notes right here. Yay. There. So while you're doing that, this is just something that has bugged me for a while. Because when I remember reading, when, when my friends and I would read X-Men, we always pronounced the uh, professor's name Xavier. Mm -hmm. And then when the X-Men movie came out and, like, uh, in cartoons and stuff, people would say Xavier. And that always oh, yeah. that always bugged me. It's like, why are you saying Xavier? Just because is that just because people like to call him Professor X, or do do people actually pronounce that name Xavier? Well, I can tell you as a Portuguese guy that uh, the X in in Portuguese has very different sounds according to what sort of word it's in. Yeah, it can be uh, it can be a, a sh sound. Like an S H, mm -hmm. you know, like she. Yeah, that in uh, Chinese, I think it, you can do that with X. Yeah, and then we also have the X sound. So it's basically it's either a sh or X. Yeah, you well, know. And in in English, it can also have a Z sound. Yeah, that's that's the thing in English that you guys have it also as a Z. So it'd be like Professor Xavier. Yeah. With but I always thought it was Xavier. Huh. Huh. Yeah, yeah, well, and that might, yeah, and I think cartoons and and the movies all, you know, say Xavier. Yeah, I guess that's that's the pronunciation of the name. I don't even know where the original name of Xavier comes from. If it's like from the Greeks or if it's like from yeah. from wherever it comes, I haven't looked into it. But well, uh, I imagine I'm, that Stan Lee would have corrected them if they'd done it wrong. But it's still, you know. Yeah, I mean, you're Ryan. I mean, I don't know if your name. Your, your name's probably German, Germanic or something. So it probably it's originally was even like pronounced differently, like Brian or something like that. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, have you ever looked into that? Uh, oh, my first name? Uh huh. No, I mean, I think my parents got the idea from, I think, Ryan O'Neill. Okay. And, and, um, they, that was the first time they'd ever heard the name, that, that name, you know, like everybody, there's no, you don't ever meet anybody hardly ever that has my first name that's older than I am. It's mostly mm -hmm. like people younger than me, and I think they thought, you know, they thought, oh, that's cool. Nobody has that name, but all my yeah. life, everybody's like, oh, is that Brian? I guess nowadays Michael is really famous. Uh, yeah. Michael as a name is like one of the top three names in america so there's right. a lot of michaels out there yeah and my dad is michael and and oh. uh, he that always bugged him because it's like it's just french for michelle <laughs> or yeah. in french it's michelle and yeah or michael from but you can't uh, say you can't name a man michelle in 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 america cause right and in, in, in the america latin language you have miguel yeah. yeah and in the latin language you have miguel which has a g on it so yeah so, which in America sometimes people say Miguel because there is a U, but that U is silent, really. Oh, yeah, instead of Miguel. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so Franz Messerschmitt, um, fantastic artist. I really didn't know about him until I read this book, until I saw the show. Me too. The A to Z. But uh, once I started looking at his work, I thought it was pretty impressive. I thought it was very uh, realistic, even even despite the the expressions that the, the faces have. I think it's even harder to make those expressions because when you're looking at classic sculpting, classic busts, the faces are always very peaceful 
and very proportionate. So it's really hard to depict the musculature when you have like a grimacing face. And I think he really did it really well. You see yeah. all the wrinkles around the eyes, wrinkles on the forehead, wrinkles around the mouth. They're so perfect that that obviously he was taking them from real life looking in the mirror. But yeah, that, and, that and is... he had a lot of motivation to get it just right, you know, for yeah. his own, you know, psychotic reasons. Yeah, for his own uh, mental peace of mind. Yeah. So, so yeah, that that was uh, that was R for Rictus, which Clive later gave this name to a character in The Thief of Always. Yeah, that, you know that, and that made me kind of think about. I wonder how much this particular man and his sculptures influenced other stuff that Clive Barker did. That's right, because the sculptures are always very similar to male figures that Clive Barker does. They're always yeah. like people like uh, male faces with no hair. Big ears and, you know, some sort of weird thing going on in their expressions. Yeah. Um, and I think that Clive probably loves this this guy's work because he included it in this A to Z of horror. Yeah. Another recommendation straight from Clive Barker. One, one more thing I wanted to say really quick, um, just for people following along in the TV series, I forgot to mention, if you're looking for Q for Quiet Men, uh, go to the episode three of the TV series, and it's the very last part. So coming up next, we have uh, Ryan's review of the body book, well, where we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. We'll we'll talk about the body book, and I'm right now. I'm in the middle of the uh, the script by Mick Garris uh, for In the Flesh. Wow, I you know I never heard about that until yeah. this book came out. To be honest, I didn't know that McGarris had had tried to adapt into flesh from the books of blood. Yeah, I th I don't think anybody knew, and I, I think that this wouldn't have even made it into the book except Christian Francis had told him, "Hey, you know, we've got this. You want it? Should, can we put this in there too?" Yeah, which was that's pretty amazing. So as soon as you finish reading that, then I guess we'll talk about it in an upcoming episode. Uh, we're also going to have more A through Z of horror, uh, including S, T, and U. Yeah. So we're approaching the last three, <clears throat> approaching the last three or four letters. <clears throat> yeah. And then we'll also talk about the uh, Epic Nightbreed comics. Yeah, and I just on eBay I just ordered the uh, Epic number two so that I could get that one um, standalone Nightbreed story. Oh I, right, I think yeah. That, that's part of that series, isn't it? Um, it's a standalone story, okay. I think. It's the the cover has like uh, Peliquin, uh, Kinski, and and Boone in a in a vintage car. Yeah, I think so. That's that's the one. Yeah, it's just a standalone story, okay. but it's 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 a cool story. It's so it's do it's you a think lovely. That it takes place bef before the events of the of the comic series. I would say after. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the comic series. I'm not sure. Yeah. It could be take place anywhere, but it definitely takes place after the fall of Median. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, just trying to place where we would talk about it in in our you know lineage of Clive Barker uh, of those comics, I guess, in, in our yeah. episodes. But yeah, we'll figure it out maybe when we're reading them. And then further in the future, we'll be talking about Clive Barker's Next Testament um, and the Leviathan book. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, and then on our site, uh, check out I, like I had mentioned a little bit ago in the you know Rob's scenes of the week. So he did one, um, I believe from, he did one, was it from Candyman? And one from, I'm going to have to rem remember, one was from Nightbreed, was uh, Your Meat. Yeah. One of them is Clyde Barker's uh, podcast scene of the week for uh, Candyman. Oh, yeah, the psychotherapist. The psychotherapist, yeah. yeah. It's funny. <laughs> Here I've been listening to our audio commentaries, you know, and and because that's where I am in listening to our episodes, and so I just finished the Candyman and the Midnight Meat Train episodes. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Rob about this scene: "Is he says I was surprised that the MPAA let this scene slide with so much gore. The red stuff is literally painting the walls. Enjoy." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other scene is uh, Peliquin. Uh, everything is true, you know. Yeah. God is. God's an astronaut. Uh, yeah. God, I, I, I can't forget that scene. It's just so striking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then um, I wrote a new 
It's funny, you know. Actually, we were just talking about this not too long ago. That that it seems like uh, in the in the Google on Google, the stuff that that shows up when we write stories, the stuff that shows up on Google is the things that have a number in them. So, like ten things to do for wax or whatever. So, I made five essentials for Clive Barker noobs, and I actually hate the word noobs, but I put uh-huh. that in there because I wanted the, t- the title to not be so long. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, basically I just got this idea, you know, I should have been going to bed, but I just got this idea. Like it seems, you know, I, I feel kind of isolated here in Fairbanks because, and everybody, every time I try to talk to somebody face to face about Clive Barker, it's like their eyes sort of gloss over and it's like, Oh yeah, sure. that's that thing that you like. And, and you, yeah. you, and you're like, Oh, you don't remember Clive Barker. Okay. Well, did you know Hellraiser? And and they'll be like, uh, no. And like, I swear, my neighbor was like, um, oh yeah, Hellboy. Yeah, I like those movies. When are they going to make the third one? <laughs> yeah. And, well, usually when I say Hellraiser, most people will, oh, the guy with the pins in his head. Yeah, yeah. that's usually what gets them. Right. But if you tell them about Nightbreed or Lord of Illusions, they they probably haven't seen it. Yeah. So I came up with an idea. Like, what do you tell these people? You know, because we we want people to be able to talk about Clive Barker again. So what do, what do you give these people to say, okay, this is like the essentials of Clive Barker. And I know there's a book called the essential Clive Barker. Um, but what I like, uh, what I thought were, you know, the, the, the very best kind of a starter kit was, um, first the books of blood. Sure. And then, uh, then the Hellbound Heart, because that's kind of a good transition from the Books of Blood into a novella that's similar mm-hmm. to a Books of Blood story. Then and Hel- also then leads to Hellraiser. Yeah, yeah, and then that leads into Hellraiser, and then, um, and then from there you kind of take a break from horror and you read The Thief of Always, and you and you kind of get reminded of what Clive Barker can do in prose. And, uh, and, and, you know, and it's a children's fable and then you kind of go, okay, now we're going to go into an adult fable and we, you read Weave World. Absolutely. Weave World is essential for, uh, for the transition from Hellraiser to the dark fantastic to, to something more like the fantastique, you know, the, the thing that is not entirely horror. There's some magic to it. There's some beauty to it. There's, you know. It's a good mix of both. And I put in the I, I put in the cheapest versions of these books that you can find on Amazon, paperbacks and DVDs and stuff. And then that way, if these people get really into it, they can go and find you know the nicer versions that later on, if they want to, they can watch more Hellraiser movies. They can read other books, and you know people would say, "Why didn't you include Imagica?" And my thinking was Imagica is really big and it might intimidate somebody, you know, starting. Yeah, I agree. This is like, uh, like you said, a starter kit for people who don't know Clive Barker. Yeah. You don't want to you don't want to start your dinner course by eating the dessert, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You want to give them some soup first, then give them like some some yeah. fish and some meat and then you go into the dessert. And I think with those five things that that would be enough to make anybody a fan if they were going to be if they ever had a chance then those those five things would get them going and they'll find the rest of that on their own or they'll they'll join groups or maybe they'll listen to our podcast hopefully hopefully yeah Yeah. well this is definitely kind of what starter kit that kind of got me into clive barker was hell hellraiser and then i saw i saw nightbreed and then i bought the books of blood and then i got weave world and I oh know it was a great and secret show. And then it was Weave world, but the great and secret show is also like part of a, a, a bigger trilogy that's still not complete. So yeah, that's I, I wouldn't I advise people problematic. And the same reason I didn't put Aberat in there because right, it's not, right. it's not finished. And yeah, but this is a great article here. And at the end you say, you've arrived. If you've made it this far, you'll want more. And the thrill is in the discovery. You're a convert, you're a fan and an enthusiast. That's a word that Clyde Barker, I think, prefers rather than fans. Yeah, you know, enthusiasts. He doesn't like, he doesn't like calling his his uh, readers fanatic fans, which is <laughs> yeah. for fanatics, and you know he thinks that's sort of derogatory. Go out into the cosm, the Fifth Dominion, and the Reef with new eyes and with your ears. Don't forget to listen to the Clive Barker podcast. <laughs> yeah, it, it, or like uh, Craig Sheffer says, the Clive Barker broadcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought I thought for a second when he said that about changing our name, but no. Right. 
Yeah. All right. So, uh, so that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode as well as lots of news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Look for our apps in the iTunes Store or Google Play Store. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.